Good morning, folks, and welcome to our online worship service for the 16th of January, 2022, and a special welcome to those of you joining us from outside of the St. Joseph Island area. Island Council discussed by email this week whether to re-enter the sanctuary for Sunday worship. The consensus of the members was that we should delay this for another couple of weeks and reassess our position towards the end of the month. As always, we are hopeful that we will be in a position to confidently re-enter the sanctuary soon. Notification will go out to you all via email or phone once decisions have been made. So, church bulletin joke time. A boy asks his father, Dad, are bugs good to eat? That's disgusting. Don't talk about things like that over dinner, the dad replies. After dinner, the father asks, Now, son, what did you want to ask me? Oh, nothing, the boy says. There was a bug in your soup, but now it's gone. Let's center ourselves for our worship. We light this light in the name of the Maker who lit the world and breathed life into us. We light this light in the name of the Son who saved the world and stretched out his hand to us. We light this light in the name of the Spirit who encompasses the world and blessed our souls with yearning. thousands of years, First Nations people have walked in this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. Here in St. Joseph Island, we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe of the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, who are partners with the settler peoples in the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. And we acknowledge their stewardship of the land throughout the ages. Let us join together in a call to worship. When we are lonely, feeling forsaken, there is one who knows how we feel. Our God who gathers us up, pulling us close to the heart of love. When we sit at the table of despair, when we nibble at life's stale crusts, there is one who throws a party for us, our God who loves to celebrate, who fills our lives with goodness. When we are mired in the muck of life, when every day seems the same as yesterday, there is one who comes to us, our God, who changes our names, our God who transforms our lives.
invite you into a time of prayer. When we stand at the edge of desolation, staring down into our emptiness, you reach out to keep us from falling. When we fumble and stumble through the shadows of our world, you offer us a little light, which is all we need until our eyes grow accustomed to the bright dawn of your grace and wonder. When we are worn down by the rough edges of life, you polish us until we gleam with hope. When we feel deserted, you adopt us as your very own. When the world files a bill of divorce against us, turning its back, you slip the ring of joy on our finger, clasping our hands to yours as you whisper vows of love, which will remain longer than the stars will burn. God in community, we give you praise for your presence. This is the good news. You are God's delight. You are God's joy. You are God's beloved. God will not remain silent, but will call you by name from the farthest corners of heaven to this very place, from God's heart to ours, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture reading this morning is taken from the writings of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 10. Isaiah writes, 
On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines. Of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 36, and if you have a Voices United, you can find it on page 762. Your steadfast love, O God, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains, O God. Your judgments are like the great deep. All living things you save. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright in heart. This morning's Gospel is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. John writes, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there was six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is offered as God's wisdom for our journey. May we walk in its truth. It must have been disastrous. Running out of wine at a wedding brought lasting shame to the family. It wasn't simply a miscalculation of how much they would need. No, it's more likely that given the widespread poverty of the day, the parents had provided all they could. It just wasn't enough. And now everybody in the village of Cana would know it. Mary, a guest at the party, notices the impending calamity. She approaches her son and asks him to step up. And she does so in no uncertain terms. Don't be fooled by the indirect nature of the request. They have run out of wine. Mary's not merely making idle conversation with her son. This is not a matter of passing interest. And Jesus knows it. Any son of any mother would know what she was getting at. 
The meta level of communication was clear to Jesus. You do something. There are a few places in the New Testament where Jesus comes off as shockingly human, and this is one of them. He's not exactly thrilled with his mother. Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. This sounds like something I might say. In fact, even I wouldn't say this to my mother. I hope I'd be a little more polite, even if I did think she was imposing her agenda on me. Jesus apparently was on a tight schedule. Whatever he meant by his hour, this wasn't it. He had it all mapped out in his head, how it was all going to unfold. And apparently it didn't involve rescuing the parents of this couple from shame or keeping the party going. Dare we say it, Jesus comes off as a bit arrogant, perhaps even petulant. Maybe he doesn't like being told what to do by his mother, but then what are mothers for if not to teach their sons a thing or two about getting over themselves? Now we have no way of knowing if this story is literally true. None of the other Gospels record it. But we do know that it represents a dynamic of the spiritual life that we all face. Over the past two years, we have all been asked to step up and do something, even though it wasn't part of our plans. Beyond the pandemic, the discovery of unmarked graves at former residential school sites calls us to step up and do something, even though it wasn't part of our plans. The climate crisis calls us to step up and do something, even though it wasn't part of our plans. Over the past couple of years, we've had a few new terms thrown at us by meteorologists. Arctic vortex, heat dome, atmospheric river. All of these things have been responsible for extreme weather events. While climate scientists will tell you that these terms have been, in, been used for many years in their discipline, the increased frequency and the dire consequences of these phenomena have brought them into the public consciousness. Arctic vortices have brought snow and ice to areas of the planet not used to the sort of weather that we are accustomed to in northern Ontario, causing havoc for travel and damaging crops. A heat dome last summer in British Columbia caused nearly 600 heat-related deaths and temperatures just shy of 50 degrees C sparked a wildfire which destroyed the town of Lytton. In November of last year, an atmospheric river dumped rain on the lower mainland of BC and the Pacific Northwest of the United States. The resultant floods caused massive property damage, several deaths, and displaced entire cities as people fled the rising waters. These are but a few of the climate-related stories of the last year. These stories and so many others from all over the world are telling us that the wine has run out. Sometimes being a Christian means stepping up even when it doesn't fit our schedule. The fact is we all need the voice of Mary pointing out to us the obvious need that is staring us in the face. Sometimes we just don't want to be bothered or we hope someone else will deal with it. Think of Mary's voice as the voice of the cosmic mother. It's the voice that interrupts our agenda with God's agenda. Today that voice is coming to us from Mother Earth. Terry Glavin, author of Waiting for the Macaw, calls our age the age of extinction. Father Thomas Berry, a Roman Catholic eco-theologian, 
says that we're living through the sixth great extinction in the history of the planet. The other five have been the result of natural causes. This one is our own responsibility. It's not that humans are bad by nature. Rather, our knowledge has run ahead of our spiritual wisdom. We've forgotten how to live upon the earth. And so the rot wine runs out each and every day for entire species of plants and animals. The wine is running out for the Bengal tiger, the sea tortoise, the spotted owls, the Kihansi spray toad and the marlin. Is it petulance, indifference, or just plain not wanting to be bothered that causes us to act as though this is no concern of ours? That's when Mother Mary comes through as the voice of the earth. She looks at us, or should I say through us. She sees through our addiction to convenience, past our smartphones and the timelines we've created in pursuit of the good life, and interrupts our plans by reminding us of what we already know. The wine has run out. Sometimes it's our own wine that runs out. Notwithstanding the endless needs of the world, some of us have given so much of ourselves that there is nothing left to give. Yet we keep trying. Mary speaks to us from deep within, pointing out the obvious. We have nothing left to give. For those of us in this situation, the party stopped a long time ago. Instead, it's become an unrelenting obligation to take care of others. Still, we don't welcome the voice of compassion when it's directed at ourselves. We push it away like Jesus. What concern is my fatigue to me? You may not think that the hour to love yourself has arrived just quite yet, but Mary, the voice of the Cosmic Mother, begs to differ. The need in this case is not out there, it's within our own souls. In our Gospel reading, Jesus steps up, just as his mother knew that he would, and orders that the stone jars used for purification rites be filled up with water. Stone, not clay, because clay was too porous and you'd risk contamination from outside elements. The symbolism is clear. If the celebration is to continue, it will begin with purification, which leads to the question of what it is within us that is in need of purification. I want to suggest that collectively the purification we are being asked to undergo is learning to distinguish between our needs and our wants. We're so inundated with advertising everywhere we turn, the purpose of which is precisely to blur the line between need and want. Because of that, our judgment is truly contaminated. I read an article in the Globe and Mail a while back about folks who call themselves compactors. 7,000 people around the world made a resolution not to buy anything for an entire year, save food and underwear. Now, I'm not saying we should all go out and join up, but what they seem to be doing on our behalf is resetting the gauge that measures when enough is enough. We need help. There's plenty of research now revealing that happiness and money are correlated only up to a surprisingly low level of income. Shortly after we reach above the poverty line, the correlation begins to break down. It's not that there's anything inherently wrong with money. And it's not that those of us with lots of it can't be happy. Of course we can. But if we are, it's not the money making us happy. It's the quality of our relationships, the integrity of our values, the sense that we're making a contribution to the common good. 
and our joy in sharing the wealth liberally. That is what make it, makes us happy. Jesus turned these waters of purification into approximately 600 bottles of wine. The symbolism in the Jewish tradition of this story is clear. Abundance of wine was associated with a new age in which God would act to bring wholeness and healing to the people. God would restore right relationships with God, neighbor, self, and earth. Listen to the prophet. The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the mountain shall drip with sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it, when my people shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. And again, our reading from Isaiah this morning says, On this mountain, the Lord will make for all people a feast of rich food and well-aged wines, well-aged wines strained clear. Let us rejoice and be glad in God's salvation. The good news is that just when we're ready to settle into sadness and hopelessness, the Holy One is just getting started. God saves the best for last. A new age dawns. Humanity is on the verge of a breakthrough of spiritual awareness. More people are becoming aware of their authentic spiritual natures. More and more of us are falling back in love with the planet and the gift of life on Earth. We're looking for alternative ways of life that leave time for deep, authentic relationship. There is a purification of consciousness going on throughout the world. God is on the move. So. Let us drink deeply, my friends, of the wine of the Spirit, which Christ offers, because the party is just getting started. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus turned 180 gallons of water into wine. Now that's an abundant and delightful God. Please join with me as we offer thanks to God for the gifts that we have shared. Generous God, sometimes a gift becomes more valuable when it is given away to someone who needs it more than we do. Help us to see ways to change our water into wine for others. Amen. I invite you to join with me in a time of prayer. 
Loving God, our hearts speak in grateful praise for all that you are and all that you have done. Your mercies are many and your blessings bountiful. We give thanks for your touch in our all of life situations. We thank you for those who continue to do good in the midst of a very individualistic and selfish world. We thank you for simple kindnesses that are experienced each day for friendly smiles behind those masks, for common courtesy and respectful relationships, for those who give directions to the lost, for those who stop to help someone in need or offer support in difficult times. For all of these people and for many more, we give thanks. We thank you for all of those who work so diligently around our churches to make them good places to be. We pray for those of our congregation. We thank you for those who help out in our community to make it a good place to live. In the midst of our thanks, we lift up in prayer the needs of this church and community. We pray for those who mourn Give them peace in the midst of grief. Give them healing in the midst of their hurts. Bless us with your soothing spirit. We pray also for those who are sick this day. We pray for those of our congregation and community who need to know your healing presence. Keep all those who are ill in your special care. God of grace and glory, hear our prayers. Remind us of our blessings and lift us up above our weariness. Shine your light upon us so that we may shine your love to others. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. God sends us out to the lonely, the forsaken, to gather them up into the heart of love. Jesus sends us out to throw a party for those who nibble at the stale crusts offered by the world, to sit with those who have no family, to fill their lives with hope and grace. 
The Spirit sends us forth as transformed people, as those who have been given new names, who long for new days, for new joy, for new wonder. May the God of love and justice accompany us. May the Spirit surround us with grace and peace as we walk the way of the Christ. Let all those who do justice and love kindness say Amen. Shalom, everybody. I'll see you next week.